Welcome back everyone. My name is Ultimar and we are going to be continuing our Let's Play of Pathfinder Kingmaker. Where we left off last time, we were entering the Six Bears camp to deal with this ghost cyclops problem. Hopefully, it won't be too hard to do. I mean, it is just a ghost. Amir, you little thief, mortal, fool, interfering in the affairs of eternal beings, it's time to return what was stolen. Shove it, Amiri throws the sword at the ghostly giant who catches it and gazes upon it, twirling it in its huge palms. Fine work, you surprise me mortals. Your life is but a breath in the wind, a snowflake in a hurricane, but nevertheless, you can at times create something that will last with the ages. This sword is even finer than the one that was stolen. Who are you? My name is Fionn. Once my brother Ken and I were powerful rulers of the first world, together we were nearly equal to the eldest, but not quite. Eternal, serene life in our land was not enough for Kian. He wanted more. He wanted to become equal to the eldest and conquer new lands. First he began to devour our subjects, drawing on their strength, and then he tried to do the same with me. As punishment, I banished his soul into the sword, which later fell into the hands of Amiri. Why do you need the sword? It's the prison of my beloved, hated brother Kian, the murderer of my family and friends, a ruler who dreamed of great power, but instead destroyed the people he ruled. You nearly released Kian by breaking the sword and he may yet free himself if the sword is not sealed, but do not be afraid, mortals. We have everything here for the ritual, the ritual that will seal my brother in the sword forever. How did this sword end up in Amiri's hands? My brother is very powerful. When I imprisoned him in the sword for his crimes, I created a very dangerous artifact. With sweet lies, the sword persuaded my servant to plunge it into my body. It drained much of my energy, turning me into this pitiful creature you see before you, a ghost, a shadow of my former greatness. My brother, in turn, used his power to escape into your world, but in this, he outwitted even himself. Our strength is linked to the magic of the first world. We are far less powerful here than we are on our home plane. Once here, the sword lost its strength, even its ability to speak. It did not bring happiness to the giant who found it. It did not bring happiness to Amiri, who looted the giant's corpse. Having broken the sword, you nearly freed my brother, but now we shall seal it forever. Why do you haunt the Sixpurish tribe? After I was struck down, a treacherous spirit fled with the sword to your world. Powerless, a shadow of myself, I followed it, for I could not allow its prisoner to break free himself. I found the body of a giant who once possessed the sword. I found the bodies of the barbarians killed by Amiri. I walked invisibly among the tribes, listening to their speech and tracing their thoughts until I learned of the sword's fate. I demanded that the Six Bears tribe find the thief. This was only fair, for the sword was stolen by one of their own. I would have it returned. If only Amiri had listened to me at our first meeting, much trouble could have been avoided, but even immortals cannot rule fate. Everything happened as it happened, and now the sword is in my hands. What happens- or what will you do now that you have the sword back? I will not avenge your theft. I never desired revenge. I only wanted to ensure my brother imprisoned in this blade would never break free. I once thought of returning him to the first world would be sufficient, but now I realize this would not be enough. There's only one way to be sure. I will cast the spell of imprisonment once again, this time on myself. I will place into the sword all my strength, which my poor brother so craved, and thus I shall share eternity with him. The sword will become our common tomb. After that, Amiri, you may keep the sword yourself, but not before the ritual is over. What happens if you don't steal the sword? My brother will free himself. He is an endless storm, greedy, cruel, unpredictable. He will do great evil, and he will start with Amiri and her tribe. He remembers you well, but, can, but I cannot see his mind. Perhaps he'll seek revenge. Perhaps he'll become his plaything. Either way, you will not survive. Let's begin the ritual. The giant brings the sword to his lips, whispering a spell. A stream of light flows from him into the blade, already transparent. The ghost becomes barely visible. The end is near. There's almost nothing left of me. I am the shadow of a shadow. I am dust and ash. My power, my immortality. I give everything to imprison my brother forever. There's only one thing left. The giant hands the sword to Amiri. To finish the ritual, the sword must be plunged into the heart of a chieftain. I would give my own heart, but I no longer possess a living body. However, there's another chieftain here. Do this, Amiri, and let eternity come to an end. Nyalek comes forward. Fionn spoke truly of the threat of his brother's release. I must protect my tribe. Do it, Amiri. I'm ready. Akaya pushes her away. Step aside, girl. This tribe needs you. Hey, you evil spirit. A former chieftain is still good enough, right? The ghost nods, and Akaya thrusts himself forward. Come, girl, strike. At least I'm still good for something. Amiri falls back, turning pale. No, 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 I won't do it. She turns to you. What is this? What should I do now? Sacrifice Akaya. Let him die with honor. 
Akaya steps towards Amiri, his back straight, his chin held high, looking hard into her eyes. Do it. Valerie lowers her head. He may not have been a good person, but in the end, when it mattered most, he acted as a worthy ruler. With a deadpan face, Amiri swings her sword. That's it. You're using the wrong sword, by the way. Oh well. Amiri kneels before Akaya's body and reaches down to close his eyes. Rest in peace, you old piece of crap. After all, you were a real chieftain, at least at the end. Approaching you, she grins crookedly. Well, chief, now I'm done with the six bears. All my debts are paid. Now you are my tribe. I go where you go. Well, we got the sword, I guess. Akaya's honor is what it's called. It is an oversized plus four frost bastard sword. It is not actually all that good, to be honest, compared to what we're currently using. Um, our current sword is vastly better than it. So. We'll probably just end up selling Akaya's honor, honestly. That sounds kind of horrible. Actually, I don't think we can. I think it's actually just stuck on Amiri's body. It's her now permanent weapon, so. Yeah. That is the end of the quest, I guess. Let's talk to Nylux, see what she has to say. Amiri, that was my duty. Enough complaining. Your duty is to take care of these dumb heads. Without you, they won't survive in the south, and you can't go north anymore. The old fart volunteered for it, finally did something good in his life. Give him a good funeral. We will. Nylak, you did not hesitate to sacrifice yourself to save the tribe. That's the act of a true leader. Thank you, it's an honor for me to hear your praise. A time of great change is coming to your tribe. Everything changes. It's foolish to believe we can hide from the whole world in our icy mountains. We pay dearly for pretending the time doesn't touch us. I'm afraid the other tribes will pay even more. What are you going to do next? Let's go back to Numeria. We're not used to change. Even there, everything seems strange to us. But Numerian Kelids are not so different from the northern ones. We would not survive here in the River Kingdoms, even with your protection. Alright, bye. Desna bless you. Look after Amiri. I definitely will do that, for sure. Alright, we have other side quests to do. Other companion quests. We have at least two other companion quests. Actually, I think we have three other companion quests to do. Oh, there's a bunch of loot here. I want to collect it all. What do we get? Okay, so they're not very good. Whatever. Plus one, plus two stuff. Nothing special. Alright, we're done. I think Amiri's companion quest for good. Probably. But, what else we got to do? Alright, companion quests. That's kingdom quests. Those are, there we go. So we need to go talk to Jubilost. We also have to go... We have to wait for the book to finish, that's fine. It's being worked on right now. We have to talk to Octavia in the garden, and we also have to talk to Ragongar in the garden. So, we gotta go back to town. And to talk to people, basically, is what we're dealing with at the moment. We have quite a while till our next main storyline plot, so... Also, I think I found a new... place to visit when I sent scouts out again. Let me just quickly check once I am done moving, because I can't actually screw the map when I'm traveling through it. Resting would be nice, don't you think? All right. I wish I could scroll out. That would be easier. All right. So that's Patax. We don't need to go there yet. I don't think I'm allowed to go there to the inconspicuous ravine yet. Any other glowy things anywhere? We also have a couple of quests. Oh, we have to Magical Prison. That reminds me, we can actually search around this area. Later on, we'll go back to Patax and just kind of wander around his wilderness. And down here, probably. Try and, uh... Find some of the monsters we need to fight. I wonder if I can go this way. Past the river bend. Like if I go Patax and then this way? It's possible we can do that. We'll try that too. Um, but for now, we are going into town. Are we fatigued or anything? Yeah, we should probably rest. We'll just rest really quickly. And then we'll go talk to people. Okay. Whoops, that's not what I meant to hit. That autosave, though, is painful now. That's okay, though. We're almost... Dish done the game, kind of. 
So we've probably about 10 hours left, maybe. And then King Eltamar proudly said, Your evil deed ends now, or is it better as we've uncovered your vile plan? Lindsay's trying to write something on the go, but she interrupts herself and looks up. Oh, your highness, we have an unbelievably, we have unbelievably terribly important news. We managed to find out, discover, invent, well, here, she points to the toy teller. He'll tell you. The storyteller waits patiently until Lindsay finishes her ardent speech. I'll have to begin from afar to let you see what I saw with my blind eyes. The stolen lands are like a cradle in an abandoned house, in which the wind swings the skeleton of a child. No few newborn kingdoms have died out here. And just after taking the first breath... So I've collected their stories, and these precious stars that have been lost to the dust, and even I begin to notice some commonalities. It's like a pattern that repeats across different embroideries, the handwriting of the same author across all their stories. One word here, another hint there. False visions, references to a mysterious patroness, lover, mentor, tragic coincidences, strangely non-random. People and countries were brought to destruction along different roads, but behind them there always stood the same ominous shadow. And we know what that shadow is, Nerissa. The name sounds ominous even in the mouth of the restless bard, an evil nymph who sent monsters to our land and did all that stuff to Tristan, but that's not even the most important part. Most importantly, if you help us a bit, we can get her. Let's start from the beginning. How'd you even come up with this? Well, it all started with the fact that I really wanted to listen to the storyteller's stories. I've been following him for some, or for a long, long time, and I asked him about some of our adventures, and sometimes I just sat beside him and we chatted. Finally, after I told him about the defaced sisters and all the horrors of the abandoned castle, he noticed that the story seemed strangely similar to the ones he'd heard before. What you gonna do? The bards know how to send messages through dreams. I try not to use it. For some reason, people get mad when I appeared in their dreams to read my new poems. Well, the storyteller came up with a ritual based on that spell. We collect everything connected to Nerissa, everything, starting with her every track in the abandoned castle. After gathering everything, we'll unite his ability to tell stories with my ability to travel into dreams, so we'll be able to enter Nerissa's dream. It's a pity that we don't have the amulet with a string of hair that Nerissa gave to you before the battle with the stag lord. You know, back when she was pretending to be a poor suffering nymph. With that, we could have finished all the preparations much, much faster and easier. What will we achieve by this? We will learn all her evil secrets. The ritual will let us see her hidden thoughts and dreams. Well, theoretically, it's not like anyone's ever done this before. It can be dangerous, the storyteller says quietly. In dreams, monsters are more terrible than we meet in the real world. But I urge you not to neglect this ch chance, King. You're opposed by a powerful enemy, one who has destroyed dozens of kingdoms and empires. If you do not meet her face to face, do not discover her weaknesses, your country will end up as just another one of my stories. Okay, go for it. Come to me after we finish preparations, and remember that I cannot send anyone except you and Lindsay into Nerissa's dream world. Whatever you have to face, you have to overcome together, and the path will likely be difficult. Of course it will. Alright, so... We'll deal with that later. Alrighty, sorry about the quick cut there. Just had a bit of a cough. Didn't want to leave it on the video. Let's go talk to Regongar and Jubilost and Octavia. I thought we should have talked to Jubilost first because he was in the throne room, but I wasn't thinking. Oh, well, we'll go talk to the other two first and then we'll go talk to Jubilost. Oh, stupid. Why do you need to? No, autosaving is good. We should not complain about autosaves. They save us a lot of times. If I were Octavia, oh, they're over there. Come on. Are you not going to walk up there? There we go. Alright, let's talk to you first. Regongra stands beside the tree, gloomily, look gloomily looking out on the city below. Ah, oh, there you are. Well, we found my tribe. Now we just have to go find, or go have ourselves a friendly chat. The half orc clenches his fists. And what about Octavia? Did you learn anything about her family? We did. Turns out she's... No, I'm shutting up. That's her, no her news to tell you. How'd you find out? Well, it's another story entirely. We looked through Janusha's books for a while, found where he bought us and from whom, who helped him. We got all we could from them, but checking up on that information would have meant traveling across Numeria and half the River Kingdoms. As you might recall, it wasn't exactly quiet there at the time. Not that it ever is, huh? But you know we'd never leave you to clean a mess like that yourself. We ended up hiring a pretty good, or pretty brave crew, headed by a good scout. We can't do everything ourselves, right? They pulled some strings, followed some leads, and figured out everything for us. Well, almost everything. The most important parts. Octavia and I will find out for ourselves when we pay our families a visit. So who's your tribe? 
The sewer rats. Wait, no, that's not it. The crowd place? The threadbare moles? Man, I just can't seem to remember. All oh, right, the dung pigs. He gives us a lopsided grin. Fine, fine. They call themselves the sharp fangs, and for good reason. Regunger grins, displaying his teeth. Smaller than an orc's, but still large and sharp. They have kids with orcs to strengthen their blood. Not bad, huh? They breed themselves like pedigree cattle. So I've really been sold twice. First by my orc so of a mother, who took some gold to push me and my brother out, never to see us again. Then my father chose which of us to keep and which to sell to the slavers. Treated like animals my whole life. I'm surprised I'm not barking on all fours. They tried to turn you into an animal, but you kept your humanity. That's something to be proud of. Huh, true, you can't break Ragongar. Okay. Alright, let's go meet your tribe. Octavia, you're up. Octavia pensively fiddles with a small metal trinket while she waits. It takes her a moment to notice as you approach. Oh, hi. It seems we haven't been properly introduced. Allow me, Octavia Della Fiorni. Heir to a noble title, a family man or manor, even a coat of arms with a motto. With a sad smile, Octavia shows you the trinket she's playing with. It's a fibula, decorated with a coat of arms, a butterfly and an arrow. At the bottom you see the motto, Serve solely my conscience. So you're from a noble family. I could hardly believe it myself, but there's no doubt. I'm the missing daughter of Marchioness de la Fione. Missing, that's what they're calling it. How'd you discover this? It took a lot of work. After going through Janusha's ledgers, not only do we find information about our purchase, we found a wealth of other data as well. Connections, suppliers, meeting places, but tracking it all down ourselves would have required crossing half the river kingdoms and all of Numeria, and we couldn't abandon you. So we did the boring but practical thing like kings or their entourage might do. We hired a team of sleuths to follow the trail, and they found everything, who bought us, who we'd been sold to, and where we're from. Finding my family is relatively easy. The Marchioness was already looking for me herself. They just needed to put a few pieces together to realize I was the missing heir to, of the De La Fione family. On the other hand, Reg's tribe had to be found with a looking glass, but it's no matter. We certainly paid them well for the trouble. Where do we find your family? There isn't one, really. The De La Fione family was waiting before I was born. My mother's the last one. She's living in Patax in a small house. I'm going to pay her a visit. I'd like you to accompany me. As you wish, Your Excellency, it would be an honor to serve you on this excursion. Octavia looks at you, confusion written across her face. At first, she seems a little offended, but a moment later, she's bent half with laughter. Excellency, oh, I can't, my Excellency, a high-born Marchioness of the highest rank. Whew. Octavia wipes tears of laughter from her eyes. Don't make me laugh so hard. Just look at me. Devils take me. What kind of Marchioness am I? You don't think I'm going to be taxed to inherit a title, do you? But thank you anyways. Title's not important. I just want to see my mother. All right, let's go talk to Regar, or no, uh, Jewelost, and then we'll head out. We'll take along our three lesser characters. They're not lesser. Jubilost is actually a really powerful character, to be honest, with his alchemy, and so is Octavia. And Regungar, they're all pretty decent characters, but... What am I doing here? Nothing here. We'll deal with that later. It's early in the morning. I'm having a little terrible braining, apparently. Ah, uh, here we go. Jubilost. Jubilost raises his head and closes his notebook. Ah, it's you. How can I help you? I found Gunderson's book, the one we were looking for. Let me see. Jubilost stares into the pages. It's a good thing I'm not a follower of Shaylin, or I'd throw this thing in the fire right now and draw the deity's wrath. Just look at this language. Shivering, she clanged to my shoulder and whispered, Will I see my only hope? Only your well-developed adventuring skills, your daring mind. Merciless eloquence and shameless courage can save a poor girl like me. But I digress. We need something that's fifth in ten. Obviously, it's about the fifth adventure from the book. The name of the chapter is In the Corner of the Tavern. Sounds like a place, but which tavern is it? The nearest one? And who or what should we look for there? Wait. We know the place, the tavern, and a number, 24. You reasonably assume that 24 is the day of the month. We have a time and a place. I propose we meet at the Capital Tavern on the next 24th and see what happens. What day is it? the 11th. That's a bit of a journey. All right. Well, we're going to make our way to do Ragongar and Octavia's quests. At the very least, Ragongar's quest. I don't know if we're allowed into Patax. We'll find out pretty quickly. Uh, we're going to take along... I wish I could just not bring along our main character. Um, we need our tank. I guess we can drop Lindsay for now. And if I have to choose currently between... Oh, we need Knock Knock. He's got the skills. He has all of our lockpicking and stuff, so... I guess, no, we're bringing Octavia. She has lockpicking. Uh, but... Uh, mm, this is such a toss-up. Amiri hits harder. Kind of. Oh, we'll bring Knock Knock. It's fine. 
And then we need you and you and you. I'm also going to level them up really quickly. And then we'll just kind of restart the video when we reach uh, Ragongra's tribal area. We'll be back shortly. Alright, we're at the Sharp Fangs tribal camp. We rested. We have our B team with us. All leveled up. More or less capable of doing stuff. I actually have never used an alchemist, to be honest. So this is going to be interesting. It looks like everyone's dead. Mostly dead. It's looking grim for the Sharp Fangs camp. There's only one guy left here. Huh. Garbage loot. Alright, let's talk to Ingid, son of Shatara. In the dry grass, you can barely make out signs that people once lived here. Burned bits of tents, rusty swords, rain-washed bones. An old half-orc is the only living soul among the desolation. Wrapped in a charred mantle, he sits on the ground, devouring a raw rabbit and tossing bones to a dog, lying at his feet. He squints as you approach, but he doesn't reach for any weapons. Hmm? Who's there? No one comes by here anymore. I'm Ragongar, son of the Sharp's Fang tribe. They sold me into slavery. Where are the Sharp Fangs? You're looking at them, the old man points to the bones scattered along the ground. All there, elders to children. Just me left of the Sharp Fangs. Well, me and you. What happened? Who are you? Ingid, son of Shatara, and the last of the Sharp Fangs tribe. Got nowhere to go, and my hands have been feeble for a long time. I sit here and bring whatever coal brings me, waiting for some kind of person to pass, or waiting for some kind of person to pass by and help an old man bury all these bones. But no one comes here. I must think it's a cursed place, and they're right. Tell me about your tribe. Our tribe was always stronger, braver, and more valiant than the other tribes. Know why? We had a tradition, or mixing our blood with, blood with orc blood, orc power with human prowess. We took the best of both races, no room for weaklings in the tribe. Weak children were either left in the field or sold to someone from the city. You say you were sold? Must have been sickly. What good would that do to this tribe? Don't blame us for your own weakness. As Ragongar clenches his fists, Octavia places a hand on his shoulder. Easy now. Let him finish. What happened to the Sharp Fangs? Dead. All dead. Chieftain's son destroyed them. See, Chieftain Agden, may he feast eternally with Gorum, didn't want anyone else's kid to become Chieftain after him, so he needed an heir with incredible power. That's why he chose Gra the Dragon Eye to bear his children. She was a mighty orc warrior who scorched her enemies with lightning, boasted of having dragons in her family. She demanded a lot of gold for it, but she delivered more than she promised. She had not one child, but twins. Agden thought that thought a while on what to do, and then wisely decided that the tribe doesn't need two chieftains, sold the weaker one to someone from the city to get back some of the gold he'd spent. Started raising the second one, Stragar, to be our new chieftain. The boy was alright, deft, cunning, strong, and he knew how to use dragon charms. Could strike an elk with lightning with his hands when he was knee-high. But there must have been too much orc and dragon blood in him and too little human. Older he got, the more, well, you know. He knocks on the head with a bony knuckle. Had a temper like a dragon. If something went wrong, he'd start fighting right off. Couldn't tell his tribe's folks from strangers and would shoot lightning at the tiniest provocation. Was always cocky with his father, too. Called him names, screaming about how Chieftain sold his brother, saying he'd look for him and return him to the tribe. In a word, crazy. Anyone else would have been happy that the Chieftain's mantle, the one I wear now. <laughs> Anyone else would be happy getting the mantle, especially with no rivals for it. But he was stubborn, wanted his brother back no matter what. Then one time, Agden grew tired of Stregar's whims, decided to teach him a lesson, as a father does. Knocked him a couple times with a long rod, and that was it. The boy screamed like the hells, and his eyes flared blue. He started shooting lightning all around. It was terrifying. I still see it in my sleep. Flames, smoke, lightning everywhere, tents burning one after another. I was too old to fight, so I hid behind a hillock to stay out of the way. Some of the others, they went at him with swords, and they all died. No one survived. Even the little ones were burned alive. He took as good as he gave, though, died of wounds soon after, and that was the end of the Sharp Fangs. Where Gargar looks at the bones scattered in the grass. Brother. He sounds like a nice guy. Best in his tribe. A lot like you. Wish I could have met him. <laughs> Me too. What do you say, Ragongar? Well, what is there to say? Don't kill the do- Oh, Ragongar, no. Ragongar severs the old man's head with a single slash of his sword, taking the charred mantle from the body and draping it around his shoulders. Live like blind rats in a sewer, die the same way. This whole story is one long, feeble joke. I'd piss on their bones if I cared enough. We should never have come here. Let's go home. The half-orc turns and walks away from the burned settlement without looking at anyone. Damn, Ragongar, seriously, you just murdered a dude? 
But more importantly, you've killed the dog. Technically, it's a wolf, I guess. Considering it gave us a wolf pelt. Uncool. Wait, why do you leave the group? Well, I guess we're gonna go do Octavius' quest without him, because... I don't really care to bring him back, to be honest. He's not really all that important to our group. We'll just swap in somebody else in a moment. Probably Amiri, who we can actually bring back now. Alright, Patax is a bit of a walk. I don't actually know if we can go into Patax. Oh, he's back. I see, okay. He didn't actually leave, leave. He just kind of... briefly... walked away. Uh, stop. Let's go this way. Anything down here? Anything cool and exciting? The answer to that is a firm no. Alright. Uh, let's see if we can go in. Nope. We are not allowed to go into the city. So... Can we go this way, though? We absolutely can. Okay. How long does it take to bring in new people here? Only 13 hours? Why does it only take 13 hours to change people here, but it takes like three days when we're like eight feet from our settlement? Whatever. Fine, Hargongar. Go away. Amiri, come back. Inconsp- Well, actually, you know- Oh, we should have just done both people. Sure, fine. Uh, we'll get rid of her as well, because what's the point of bringing her along? We can't even go into the tax, so. Inconspic- Ooh, a giggling hill. We do need to go to the giggling hill. It is part of this mysterious shrine quest. I think this is the last mysterious shrine we're supposed to go to. But I also hear a portal. Or maybe this isn't the place that I'm thinking of. Yes, it is. It totally is what I'm thinking of. It's also a place where we can go to the first world, but... Uh, which one's this one? Hang on. Just gonna quickly look it up, because I don't know where my notes are from last time I played through the game. Well, I know where they are. I just don't know where they are, you know? Oh, we finished it, though. Queen Ravina, a moan echoes around you, full of old pain and deep relief. As you move to the last megalith into place, a woman appears before you. The same woman whose ghost you saw when you discovered these ruins. Her shoulders tremble slightly, but the posture displays strength and authority. Alive again, finally. The woman turns to you. I can barely find the words to express my gratitude, stranger. Those who betrayed me, they did oh so much to prevent me from returning to this world. And yet here I am, and it is thanks to you. I'd like to reward you before I leave to take my revenge. Who are you? My name is Qu uh, my name is Revena, Queen Revena. Once, but my with my kingdom lost to the dust of centuries, there is little sense in the title. These lands were previously mine until my beloved knights betrayed me. You mentioned something about revenge. It's a long story. I'd prefer not to waste any time. But as you were the one to rescue me, you deserve at least a brief explanation. Long ago, I ruled these lands with the help of my five most trusted knights. We were close, like sister and brothers, perhaps even closer. And it was those five beloved souls who betrayed me. They knew all my secrets. They knew the locations of my shrines and their purpose. They also knew that my patrons, the demon lords, would never let me die in peace. That's why my knights changed the order of the megaliths at my shrines, severing my ties with the abyss so I could not call upon the demon lords to rescue me. And so it happened. The blades of the betrayers pierced my heart and my spirit was locked in the shrine until you set me free. Sadly, centuries have passed. My five brave knights are all long dead and I can't look into their eyes and ask them the questions that have burned within me all this time. And yet, their offspring still live in this world. I will find them, make them mine. Their great grandfather so feared serving a demon worshipper that they betrayed me the one they swore their lives to protect their great grandchildren the blood of their blood will become either demon worshippers or demon prey they will be my revenge well i really can't let you leave sad but expected oh lord the abyss your daughter calls upon you all right does she, where is valor oh valerie goes after her of course luckily we just have to move a couple people back and then valerie should be there, I hope. Let's haste, though. We're probably gonna need it. And then we'll song. Maybe we can just move a Mary in. Eh, we'll see what happens. Oh my god, she's not that tough. Never mind, let's go beat her up. Why can't you try- are we fatigued? No, Smilodons can't be fatigued. Alright, I've never used Jubilos, let's see what happens. 
Oh, let's not use an acid bomb though. We'll have to use an alchemist bomb. And not hit our people. This spell has other uses. Do you have to just cast it at someone? Hit her for 46 damage. And then killed her. Don't even hope you've gotten rid of me. Ooh, she's got fancy gear. Alright, she has revenants in most. Let's look at all of them. We're gonna go into items and sort by date. Newest to oldest. Alright, here we go. We got revenant shadow, plus 5 resistance, bonus all saving throws, and immunity to poison. Uh, DR10, cold iron, and good. Uh, strength and dex belt, plus 4. Heavy armor, full plate, plus 4. Adamantine, heavy shield, unidentified. Interesting. And Revenous Kiss, plus 5 Bastard Sword, Adamantine as well. Other than the shield, which we don't know. Interesting. Well, we killed her. It wasn't really all that hard. But... She's now dead. I don't remember doing the fifth of those things, though. Maybe we did, and I just don't recall it. We're gonna quickly do this first world thing. A bunch of red caps. Like a lot of red caps. Alright, let's do this thing. We still have haste, so. That red cap savage has just the most hit points. Oh god, stop hitting knock knock. We need to cast heal on knock knock so he doesn't die. Is that heal? Yes, it is. All right, he's fine. Uh, all right. Why do these rowdy savages have so much health? Like, just a monstrous amount of health. That takes care of that one, at least. Oops, didn't need to pause. Our formation's all out of whack, which is why we're getting hit by right. things in a weird position. You out of our story. Okay. Oh, there's another one that came in. As is tradition. Alright. Uh, Jewel lost. Throw more bombs? No. But I killed one, so good enough. Valerie's turn finally. And a Miri. I'll take the AO wolf from that one, it's not a big deal. Alright. That one's dead. Still got tons of life on these things though. Main character. We could probably take a couple shots. We even killed one. We should probably fix our formation after this. We'll five foot step because we want full round attack. And Knock Knock just killed it. Knock Knock's damage is pretty insane nowadays. With eight attacks around with haste. It's pretty good. Alright. We killed them all. Let's quickly take a look at our formation. Knock knock should not be front. Under any circumstances at all, really. You should be like right here. Good enough. Everyone else is fine though, right? Maybe not that one, no. Let's put you there and put you there. There. That's better. I'm just gonna collect all to make it easier for us. Let's take a look around. So we killed some red caps. There is a corpse, which has a scimitar, thundering claw of the bear god, which is actually a pretty decent scimitar, and amulet of agile office plus four. And that's it for the giggling hill. It looks like pretty small area, but we did kill a revna, which is kind of neat. We are going to end the video here, though. I think we're a little bit over time, honestly, but whatever. It's all fine. Like always, if you have any suggestions or comments, please leave them below. Otherwise, I'll see you all in the next video, and we will continue on our side questing, I guess. We're kind of waiting for the 24th, so we're just going to kind of look around. 
the area and see what we can find in terms of things to do, since we can actually explore Patax now. Alright, I'll see you guys next time. Take care.